Hello everyone, welcome back to another STAT 385 lecture. So in this lecture, I'm um, pretty, pretty excited for this one because um, I'm going to follow David Dalpiez's Moneyball in R script, and this will cover um, a lot about the tidyverse and about um, baseball analytics, and I'll just have a preview and a shout out for my course, Stat 430 Baseball Analytics. If it, this is something that you're interested in, then you know maybe you'll wanna go through this and then consider my course, which will also be very deep plier and tidyverse heavy. Okay, so that being said, and I still wanna say that, yes, I am interested in baseball, mainly from the analytics perspective, not, not necessarily from the game perspective. Um, I guess you could say that I am a fan of the Cardinals, but I just don't follow it that closely anymore. I follow what's going on in the analytics space and um, how people are, or the approaches that they're using to assess the value of players. And that's my primary um, interest. And I'm interested in comparing players across errors. I'll get into some of that stuff a little bit later. Um, okay, so a little bit of you know, sort of history about not necessarily Moneyball, but about like David Dalpiez and myself, um, our interest in it. So first of all, backing up a bit. So full credit to David Dalpiez for the materials in this lecture. David and I are uh, collaborators on baseball analytics. We have a joint internship position with the Chicago Cubs where we worked with uh, people there, we advise students, we work on baseball related projects. We even work on Stat 35, a um, little bit of history of the course. Um, Professor Chris Kinson and I uh, created the sort of the current version of the course. And then I taught it a few times. And then after that, David Del Piez's wife taught it, then he taught it and they've revamped it. And so now we've gone back and forth on what materials to include and we've gone back and forth on baseball research so this very much is um um very fun for me to see what he's done and to follow along on his um right up here and demonstrating the tidyverse um okay so now on to moneyball so i'm not going to get too deep into baseball however i think that this is a really good example of um the power of statistics so um Baseball has always been a game uh, dominated by numbers, numbers to describe or statistics to describe the value of players. And then, you know, in the, back in the day, they use relatively simple descriptive statistics, means, for example, the, the, the mean um, or, well, you know, you can think of it as empirical success uh, probability, batting average, hits divided by at bats. So it's just one thing divided by another. Um, you could think of it as an average of Bernoulli outcomes if you like. Um, and then that would be just the way at assessing who was good or not. Now we have all kinds of, you know, data that is collected and ways of assessing player values. Um, but that all came ahead. Um, well, I don't want to, I mean, this is something that I've been developing for a long time, studying statistics as a way to assess the value of players, but it really got going in the early 2000s with a baseball team called the um, Oakland Athletics, who was essentially looking for a way to um, compete with the clubs that spent a lot of money. And it turned out that there was a way that there's many different ways of assessing player values and they wanted to, um, in a sense, find um, metrics that translated better to on-field success than the more rudimentary metrics that were being used. And they were able to do this for a while um, and field really competitive teams, or, or rather I should say, not because of the metrics, but they were used to, um, they had a competitive team and they were, they were able to use these metrics to sort of round out their roster and compete with clubs that spent a lot of money. And then um, the, um, the, the other teams caught on very quickly and now everybody's using some sort of analytical approach to um, assess the value of players. And so now it's one of the things where you sort of 
have to be in this money ball space to just keep up. Okay, so again, so kind of to, sum, to summarize here, um, baseball has always been around, always been a game of numbers to some extent, and then statisticians or statistics inclined or analytically inclined people showed that there are better approaches for assessing the value of players as far as you know which metrics to use which translate to or predict on field success better or describe on field success better than rudimentary techniques and so statisticians data scientists data analyst type people have now um now work in the space of baseball because they've been able to show value so that could be anybody in this in that could be any one of you um um and that it doesn't necessarily mean that you've had to play baseball or like baseball um but it just it's a it's a great example about the value of um statistics we'll say okay so here is david's script we're just going to go through this and create some of these graphics for describing baseball players i guess yeah so he wrote this in early march and so he's saying, welcome to opening day. The baseball season has started. Baseball season is now over. We're in the postseason. So I guess that that's kind of interesting. So, okay. So, ba, 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 ba. so what are we going to do? Oh, there's a nice YouTube link here to a clip from the movie Moneyball. Um, oh, I should say Moneyball was, was a pretty famous book written by uh, Michael Lewis about the Oakland A's and how they're able to field the team analytically. And then there's a movie with Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill. And I can't just clip on the, this, this page here. The page is linked on the website. Um, but I can't show it because I'm on YouTube and there's all kinds of copyright stuff. But, but it is here. See, there is the thing that is here. Okay. So let's see here. We are going to look at the all-time home run leaders. So... For those of you who aren't feel familiar with baseball, a home run is, okay, so there's a person who throws a ball, there's a person who swings a stick, and if they hit the ball and it goes over the fence, that creates an automatic run. It's the best offensive event that you can do in baseball. It's the most valuable outcome. So we will look at the people who have hit the most home runs all time. Okay. And another reason why I like baseball data or baseball analytics is um, because there is just a wide variety of meaningful, interesting data that is just right at our fingertips. And just to demonstrate here. So I have a script that I call, I'm going to call Laman.R. And that is an R pack. There's an R package called Laman, which I'm going to load in with these other ones. And it basically contains a whole bunch of data frames containing just a bunch of information on baseball players. Okay, so in particular, we are going to use a few of them. And I'm just gonna change them to tibbles just for printing purposes. Okay, so batting. So let's view it. So this contains um, a bunch of information. So it contains each row is a player indexed by an ID, year, and team. So it's not player year combos because players can get traded or whatnot. Um, and it contains basic offensive events for batters. So we can see HR, which is short for home run. Um, okay, so we could just select player ID year id oops team id and home run and you can see some information notice that we have data going all the way back to 1871 so baseball's been played for quite some time so that's nice okay so we're also going to need people Okay, so what does this do? What's in here? So this is a bunch of descriptive information on the players themselves. So note that in the, in the batter's data set, 
there's no really descriptive information of the players. It's just all indexed by these player ID codes. So it's rather, um, I would say, it's kind of annoying. Um, but we can get the information on the people themselves by looking at uh, the people data set. So this is gonna have information on batters and pitchers, but you'll note that it has the same player ID unique identifier. So possible that we'll see some joins here. Um, and then, you know, maybe we want to also look at the Hall of Fame or data on, hall, uh, on the Hall of Fame. So we'll create the same data set that Dalp has created where we see, where we look by career home runs and we'll see whether or not the people are in the Hall of Fame, noting that there's some NA values. Okay, so, and we'll get into some of that. So you would think that, so Hall of Fame is essentially the highest honor that a player can receive. And you would think that people who were very, very, uh, uh, hit a lot of home runs, who, you know, the most valuable offensive events would be in the Hall of Fame. However, that's not the case. And we'll get into some of that. Okay. So do, 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 let's display it, see what it looks like. Okay, Ooh, that's annoying. Oh, that's better. So we can see player ID, whether or not they're in, or whether or not they were inducted in that particular year. Okay, great. So we want to create this table. So player ID, name, home run, in hall. Okay, so we want to get seasonal, and or we want to take, so this batting data set is displaying home run per year per team ID. Okay, so that's not useful for us right now. Okay, so how about we do, we could take one of these players. Um, I don't like those players because there's an 1871 and I don't know who they are. So let's just, Yeah, let's look at this guy. He's this this player is really good. I know I I'm on Baseball Reference or Vaman often, so I I can read these codes. This player is a player who is very good this year, so we'll look at them. Okay, so how about I filter my player ID equals this player? Okay. So you can see that they haven't played for a lot of seasons, but in 2019, they hit their most, his most home runs, 41, um, which is a pretty good score or a pretty good amount of home runs in a season. Um, okay, so this looks like, so what I would want to do is essentially to get career home runs, I want to summarize home runs equals sum home runs. Okay, so this person through the 2022 data has hit 120 home runs. Now I know that um, the 2023, for, for those of you who are baseball fans, I know that the 2023 season has ended. However, the Lama data set that I have is only through 2022. Um, and I've checked it recently and they haven't updated it. I haven't checked it that recently. So maybe they have updated it, but I'm gonna just continue working through the 2022 data set. Okay, so this works. So again, we're going, I'm just kind of just going through dplyr stuff right now. Um, this right now works very well for, um, for one particular player. However, that's not very useful for me. What I want is to do this for all the players. And I'm gonna go down a bit here because I want to stay relatively organized. Okay, so let's get rid of this. I don't need that arrange there. I don't need that. Okay, summarize home runs. Okay, so I just recently learned a trick where I can put the by inside of the summarize code and I can just do player ID. 
Okay, yeah, what does this do? Cool. Okay, and then I can arrange by home runs. Okay, great. So now I see. Okay, so it's range by home runs. Okay, nice. Okay, so this isn't very useful because it has these goofy codes. Um, and unless you have like a lot of experience with these codes, it's um, not really something that is very useful. And if you have no experience with them, they don't say anything. So let's do, let's look at this people data set. Okay. Um, let's do, I know I could just use the tibble directly, but I'm, okay. So here we see name first, name last, name given. Okay, so that's useful. So let's do people select player ID, name first, name given. Okay, so name first, name last. So it looks like name given is first name, middle name. Mm, so that's not that useful. So maybe we just want name last. Okay, so that's nice. Let's do, let's take this thing and now join in people by player ID. Okay, so I can do this in a number of ways. I could, okay, so people contains a bunch of stuff I don't want, right? A bunch of columns I don't want. We have all this information. Like I don't really care about a different ID or which country they died in or something like that. I just, I want to create this table, player ID, name, home runs, and hall. So I just need information on name. So I could do subsetting here, which is kind of you know an interesting concept, or I could do the subsetting after I do the join. I'm just gonna do that. Okay, so left join, and then I wanna select player ID, name first, name last, home runs. Cool, okay. And then I also want to use some tidier to unite those columns and just call it name. Unite name, name first, name last. And I'm gonna use a slight separation here, space. Even better. Great. Okay, so now we have descriptive information, on, or we have names for these players. Um, if you're baseball fans, this is going to look pretty familiar, I would say. Okay, so now this last thing, this Hall of Fame data, let's look at it. Hall of Fame has two more variables, category, inducted. Okay, you know what? I'm going to browse it by, I'm gonna just, oops, sorry, what am I doing? I'm gonna pick a person who I know spent a long time in it. Ooh. I don't know how to spell this person's name. E. Oof. There we go. Okay, so you can see here, this player had, in 1998, was eligible, did not get inducted. In 1999, did not get inducted, so forth and so on, until 2011 got inducted. So we have a lot of information on particular players here. And I just wanna know, did they get inducted? Okay, so what I need to do, I could do something like, summarize, create a variable name in hall, 
equals any inducted and the code for that is y and I want to do this by equals player ID. Okay, so you can see the people who, got, who were inducted here. Well, it's true false variable, but it's gonna have the information for all the people who were, who, who have entered the process, who have received votes, I guess. Okay, so I can take that thing And I can see it has my it has the same player ID. So this is what's really nice about all this baseball data is that there's it's all given to you and it's really good for demonstration purposes, especially this Lawman package, because all of these data sets I'm referencing use the same uh, column player ID. It's in the same format, and so I can just join these things all together. So it's really nice, and you can see how this is something that you would have to do in real life if you were a, da a data scientist. You'd have to be just joining together data sets all the time. So this is great practice for something that um, I like, and I hope that you like as well, or at least can see the appreciation uh, or the appreciation for it. Okay, so I want to do left join. I want to create this tibble that I just created. You know what? I'm just going to take the code. Okay. Summarize. Oh, wait. But I need to, I actually need a Hall of Fame here. Why so? So I'm going to join a tibble by player ID. Oh, that's another thing. So this is the tibble that I want to join by player ID. Hmm. Do I have to put that in quotes? I, I might. Oh yeah, in quotes and okay. All right, great. Okay, so this is the variable. Nice. Okay, so it's a little bit different than David Dalpiaz's. Why is it different? Oh, I think this must be through, okay, so this is through 2021, and Alex Rodriguez, hmm, maybe he, maybe he wasn't yet on the ballot? Yeah, he might not have been on the ballot yet. And so he had no information in the data set. Pujols. So the way that it works is that it's five years after a player retires, um, and then they're eligible for voting. So this person here, who's hit a lot of home runs, hasn't appeared on the ballot because they retired really, uh, uh, really recently. Um, okay. So we can see here that there's a lot of people who didn't make, who aren't on the hall, who aren't in the Hall of Fame despite hitting a home run, a lot of home runs. Why is that so? because performance enhancing drug allegations or or they just did it they so it's been a whole thing in baseball and maybe sports in general about people who have been using um, performance banned performance enhancing drugs or performance enhancing drugs that have since been banned um, to um, essentially improve well improve their performance and that's it's been a whole debate long story short those people are looked down upon by the baseball writers. Um, there's a lot of opinions um, on that kind of thing. I don't know. I, I'm not going to linger on it too much. I think some of these players should probably be in the Hall of Fame because they're they were really good and they were really good when they weren't thought to be on performance enhancing drugs. Anyways, so this is what we're asked to do, or I should, this is what I wanted to do to demonstrate tidy verse and tidier um, and we did it great looks great um, so notice that on on his website here he has this data table command um, and then that's in this DT package and that's creating inside of this this nice like web page that you see this little this idea that this like 
sorting type stuff. Okay, so you can see, actually, you know, let's go, let's go down a little, okay, so this person just made the whole thing, whatever, okay, so that's, that's that. Okay, so, ba 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 ba. what's the next thing to do? Okay, so this is, this is actually pretty interesting. Um, so this is called Pythagorean Theorem of Baseball. And what this is, is just a extraordinarily simple equation that basically, po that, that's, um, well, what's the way to describe it? If you have the number, the number of runs that a team scored, two numbers, number of runs a team scored, and, a num and the number of runs allowed a team scored, then this equation should very accurately predict the team's winning percentage. And it's a very simple equation. It's this run squared divided by run squared plus runs allowed squared. Um, and you can see some simple things in it um, that if runs is greater than runs allowed, then this number is gonna be greater than 0 0.5. Think about it for just a sec. Okay, there's also some pretty interesting things that happen um, with this. So, you know, you, you, you sort of know that the more runs you score relative to runs allowed, the better you are. But if you look at raw run differential and you say um, a team that scores 10 runs per game, I know this is totals, a team that scores 10 runs a game um, and allows five is the same as a team that scores six runs but allows only one. On run differential, they're the same. On this equation, they're dramatically different. And um, just due to the nonlinear uh, nature of this equation. And if you plug it in, you can see that the team that scores six on average and only gives up one on average is just is predicted to have a much better winning percentage. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. Um, 10 versus five, there's a, there could be a lot of a variability in both the 10 and the five, but when you have six versus one, maybe there's some variability in the six, but in the one, it's pretty constant. So it kind of makes sense that this just like generalizes um, beyond run differential. And it is just, it's great. What's also really cool about this equation is that it was discovered by a person with very little formal statistical training who I, from what I gather, um, just stared at spreadsheets long enough to sort of intuit out this equation. And it is very, very solid work. Um, and the person in question is um, uh, Bill James, who's credited for sort of starting or popularizing the analytics movement in baseball. And so this person, not much statistical training, not much baseball training, full on outsider, and was able to sort of get the ground going on on this analytics movement. And then it, you know, it, it, grew and grew and grew until, you know, eventually the Oakland A's used Moneyball or analytics to start winning games. And then from there, once one team did it and was successful, now it's just the norm. Okay, so very cool background on this. Um, yeah, I know David is looking at the movie, but the actual history is pretty, uh, pretty cool. Cooler than the movie. Okay, so we're gonna do this and investigate this equation. All right, so this is Pythagorean theorem of baseball. Winning percentage should be runs scored squared divided by runs scored squared plus runs allowed squared. Okay, technically a better equation could be given by an exponent that's slightly less than two. If you take my baseball analytics class, we'll go into that. Um, but anyways, okay, so let's, investigate. Okay, so ba, 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 ba. what do I want to do? Okay, so we don't need that anymore. Okay, we have our nice little table. We don't need this. Okay, so let's do, now we need information on teams. So we have league ID 1871, we have the teams, and we have total information on the teams. Well, total information. There's a lot of stuff that's in A, but that's okay. Um, so here we have again total home runs, but the things that we're interested in are runs and 
is it earned run? No, runs allowed. There it is. Okay. And games. This is kind of interesting. Um, this column here. They didn't play as many games as they do now, but I guess what's interesting to even the non-baseball fans watching this is that it's very variable. You think of baseball as like, you know, like an institution that's very modern. And so when you go back to 1871, you can see like one game, one team is playing 19 games and another team is playing 32. And then the next season, there is a team that doesn't even exist in the league and they played 50. So who knows what's going on? Okay. Um, all right. So what we want to do, let's just get, let's look at a more modern season. The most recent season. Okay. And let's select the things that are useful here. Year ID, team ID, wins. So we want to compare winning percentage to um, this equation and runs allowed. Okay. Yeah, that's what we want. So you can see this team was pretty good and their runs and runs allowed are dramatically different. Okay. All right. So then let's go on and create our variables. So let's do mutate. I want to create, how about when percentage equals runs squared divided by runs squared plus runs allowed squared. So we can see it. And let's do oops. Pythagorean wins equals round 162 times we just created so this is the estimate of wins based on the equation okay wow that's pretty neat because the best team in this uh, print display is predicted to have 122 wins by the by the very basic Bill James Pythagorean equation and they won 101, so it's only off by one. And here we have another really good team. It's off by three. We have a really bad team. It's essentially the inverse of this one, and it's based on just the runs information. They were expected to win 63. So this is this is doing pretty well. Okay, so that's cool. So now let's GG plot. Let's like visualize this. See how it's doing. I can do I can do the aesthetic right on the outside. Let's just do that. So let's look at the relationship between wins and predicted wins by our equation. Hmm. Oh yeah. What am I doing? Hmm? What happened? Oh, switched ggplot too soon. Okay, well that's annoying. That's really annoying. Wow, that's a pretty good line. Let's you know, and let's add a smooth. What's that smooth there? Almost a straight line. Very cool. Let's just make it a straight line. Use LM formula equals Y twiddle X. I believe it's just the default. So straight line fits it very well. Can I do how does this work? A little quadratic. Did that do anything? Or do I have to actually specify 
this is kind of, yeah, I have to specify it. So even though a linear fit may not, I mean, I don't know, I mean, we, we, could, we could test this um, fitting linear models, but even just like eyeballing a simple quadratic fit here, it doesn't actually improve too much on the linear fit. So essentially what this is saying is that um, actual wins and Pythagorean wins are pretty good. Look at the line, or look at the point 80, 80. It's basically right on the dot. So this very simple equation is doing a very good job. Okay, and also, I know we're not gonna go into too much depth on these bots, but I don't, we can make it a little bit better. Okay, what team is this? Okay, so some this team underperformed a bit, but they they did really well. This must be that team we saw in the data set, the first ten rows. Okay, great. Let's do the same thing and look at teams from. It's a good year. Nineteen eighty. Oof. So what's going on? Actually, you know, let's do 1990. It's not gonna change too much. Okay, we got rid of some, it's fine, 1990. Um, okay, so it looks like there's something, there's a group here that would fit with a straight line really well, and then we have some pretty crazy seasons. So if you've been, awake for the past few years, you may have heard about the COVID pandemic and it affected baseball just like it affected everything else. There's a shortened, shortened season. So our, so essentially what we're doing here, we didn't really pick the right scale of the variables uh, to measure because um, we're looking at wins as a total and this uh, winning percent variable as a as a rate and then we scaled it up to a total and that doesn't work very well um, when there's major disruptions in the baseball se uh, season so COVID being one of them the the season was shortened to 60 games so here you know team only won 30 or you know 30 uh, less than 45 and they're predicted to win 150 based on this um their their runs and runs allowed um which makes sense um if a team did really well by runs and runs allowed and then you scale it up by what do we scale up by oh 162 so so david actually is going to go through and fit these yeah, you know what, we should do it because it does demonstrate some some coolness with um, mutate. Okay, so let's do it. Mutate, I'm gonna create a variable season type. Oh, and I should say, that's COVID. In 1994, there was a legit labor strike. Um, so that, messes things up. There's actually one in 95 as well. It doesn't look like, maybe that's that little group here, but it doesn't look like it has that big of an effect. Okay. Season time, and then there's this case when argument. Okay, so this is, this is pretty cool. Year ID equals 2020, we can do. COVID 2020, here ID, ID four, dot default equals normal. Okay, so, and then I'm gonna, by season type. What did I do? Oh, geez, I'm being really silly. 
Okay. Awesome. So we can get, so this is fitting, so this is essentially breaking this up and is fitting separate linear models for each of these different cases. And we can see that the straight line fit does pretty well for each one of them separately. And together, when we put it all together, we're getting something really silly because we have these extreme points here, which is just messing with the total line. But basically, we can see that the relationship between wins and predicted wins by our equation broken up across these different um, groupings of seasons does pretty well. Let's just add one more just to make sure. 1995, and we'll call it the labor strike continued into 1995, although it wasn't as dramatic. Yep, it was that group right there. Okay. Cool. Maybe there's some sort of Gaussian mixture model problem that somebody can do to classify the 95 seasons versus the normal. We're not going to do it here. Um, okay, cool. So that's nice. Now, instead of doing 162, we can just do games directly. So in COVID, there's 60 games. In 94, there's some number of less than 162 games. Same thing in 95. And then the normal is 162. And how does that look? Oh, I need to select it. Mm. Okay. And we basically get our straight line relationship back. Just to follow the David Dalpia's script, we'll just get rid of 95. Actually, you know, I like it better with 95. It looks like the lines are a little bit better. Very, 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 very cool. Okay. Nice. All right, so we have gone through, looked at home runs this very simple equation here. And now we will do StatCast. Okay. So, so this is Baseball Savant and what they do is they collect, actually, you know, let's just look at, one particular pitcher, give a demonstration of this one of loads. Okay. So this is a player, a pitcher, person throwing the ball. And they have some basic statistics over here, but then they have all of this information on which pitches they throw, distribution of that, um, of that pitch, at least by, what is this by? by velocity, miles per hour, how hard they throw it, and they have some where the league average is. So, and they have all kinds of cool like visualizations. So this would be their fastball, where in the strike zone, or where in just where they throw it, the location information by sort of a heat map here. So basically to create all these plots, they have information on all of the balls that this pitcher th threw. Um, moreover, they have all of the balls that every pitcher threw dating back to 2015. However, the data is the technology to track the data was fairly unreliable before 2017. So this is like a massive data set, right? All the balls thrown and they have all this information on you know, location stuff, but they also have velocity, how how much the ball spins, location, or like arm, sorry, where's my, like arm location on like where they released it in three-dimensional space. This is in, you know, two-dimensional space here. Um, they have movement information, all kinds of stuff. And then they have a lot of stuff for the batters. If they swung, what, I mean, they have basic event stuff, but like if they swung, how hard the batter hit the ball, how high in the air by angle, launch angle they they hit it. And like, if I have my field, where sort of the angle that they hit it onto the field, 
all kinds of stuff. So it's a pretty big, it's, it's millions of observations and a bunch of columns. So it's a pretty big data set. We're not going to do that part of it. Um, I should say, okay, so let's go to, let's save this. Great. Statcast, and there are some software packages for getting this Statcast data. These um, packages are developed by people in the baseball analytics space, Professor Jim Albert, which, give me one second here, is one of the authors of the one of the canonical analyzing baseball data with our books, which my stat 430 baseball class will teach from that book. And I am uh, proud to say that Professor Jim Albert has spoken in my class um, each time that it's been offered and plans to do so again. So that's really cool um, for me and for everybody. Um, and anyways, so People have developed using using code that he has written, um, ability to scrape this stat cast data. And then David Delph, he has, has taken that further and written his own package, um, which you can, you can use to get that data itself. We're not gonna do that, um, but this is what the code looks like. So basically he has, where is BBD? Oh, okay. Oh, that's the code here. So he's created BBD package, short for baseball data, for actually scraping Stackhouse data. It's a, ni it's a nice package. I, I really like it. I, I teach it in my class. Um, okay, so basically, if you want to follow along and actually get the data, you should know that this will take a very, very long time to run because essentially what it's doing is it's going to scrape all of the stat cast data from the 2022 season and that is going to be millions of observations. Is it a million? It's going to be hundreds of thousands of observations and it just takes a long time to do it. So be careful and note that. So he's already gone through the work of identifying where in this data set D Dylan ceases the picture that we're going to study. Um, what his um, advanced media, MLB advanced media ID is, that's going to be the key that StatCast uses. And then there's his key baseball reference. So he's gone through the work and found all the information on Dylan Cease, and he has compiled it into this Cease 2022 RDS file. Okay, so this is a different way of loading in data. Um, using an RDS file, we're gonna use CIS 2022 uh, as read RDS. Okay, so we, we covered reader in, in class. This is a sort of compression technique to make, I guess the uh, file is easier to load, easier to save, okay. Hmm. What's going on? <laughs> oh. So I always like to organize. I got too excited about this lecture. I always like to say where I'm organized, how I've organized myself. I'm in the STAT 385R project, as always. And um, I created a directory called Moneyball. And in it, I have these scripts that I'm working on and editing. And I also have a data directory that contains this that RDS file. So if you click here on Professor Dalpiaz's page, then it'll get this uh, Cease 2022 RDS file, and you don't you won't need to go through the work to getting it yourself. Okay, this is code that would create a strike zone. I'm not going to mess with it. Um, this either did I wonder did he create this or did Jim Albert? I think it's a combination of either way. I think Jim Albert, Professor Jim Albert has, I mean, he has an immense blog supporting this book with a whole bunch of just analysts, uh, like analysis scripts that he's now gone back and spent a great deal of time organizing. So I think David just pulled it from there. So anyways, this is going to create a strike zone for a visualization. Um, 
yeah, let's look at what we're trying to do. We're, we're going to essentially try to recreate some of these stat cast graphics for Dylan Cease, this kind of stuff, um, like where his pitches are going, and this plot right here. We're not going to recreate them perfectly, but we're going to approximate them. Okay, so we need information on all of the different pitches that he throws, and then we're going to look at the velocity distributions and then locations. Okay. Cool. So for this visualization, you can see here, this is the strike zone. So that's why that's created. Okay. So cool. We'll just run that. So what do we need to do? So we have Dylan C's data. What does it look like? So we have pitch type that he threw and we have release speed, release position. Okay, so we have, we have the things that we need. There's a lot of stuff here. Okay, so first of all, let's just do some descriptive statistics. Let's look at how many of each, how many times he threw each pitch. Dot by equals the pitch. Type. We'll look at the stat cast encoding for the pitch and the pitch name. Okay, so he throws these pitches. Some of them he throws way more than others. Oh, he threw a slider quite a bit. That's cool. More than a fastball. Um, typically speaking, pitchers throw a straight on ball as hard as they can throw it. The four seam fastball is what it's called. Um, and that's usually the pitch that a pitcher would throw most often. Um, so it's cool when you see somebody throw another pitch more than that one. Um, a slider is like straight on and then it sort of just breaks glove side. So if I'm right-handed, it'll break to the left a little bit. So that's fun. It typically doesn't have the same velocity as the fastball and you, you trade off some of that velocity for some movement. So pitchers that can throw a fastball and a slider relatively from the same arm location or the same arm like position um, will do extraordinarily well. It will really fool the batter. And if you can mix in a bunch of other pitches that you have you know, good command of, then if you can release them from relatively the same location, you're going to be doing extraordinarily well. Okay, so we're not going to get into too much of that release point stuff, but yeah, okay. So we can see here that there's also these NAs. And I think that that's because StatCast records event information for, for non-pitches too. Stuff like, um, I don't want to get, the, just non-pitch information. We don't need to get into what baseball is at this level. Okay. So basically what we want to do is, that's cool. We want to remove the is.na stuff pitch type okay gg plot and let's create this first one where we look at the different velocity distributions okay aes the variable is called release speed. Okay, so that's on the x-axis. Hmm. Oh, wait, what am I? Oh, no, I'm looking at something different first. Well, okay, sorry. Well, let's go back to what David did. Oh, yeah, we're doing this one first. We're, Plot, plot release spin rate release speed sorry spin rate well okay so let's look at this first I keep doing this geom point okay so you can see here that there's some clusters, which is kind of cool. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know if if you hadn't seen if you haven't seen baseball. This is actually a really good question for the people who haven't seen baseball before or don't know much about it. If there are four different pitches that this person throws predominantly, um, or it looks like four different clusters here. It looks like because it looks like this gets a little bit skinny right there. So does it make sense to you that? there would be some sort of give and take between speed and spin rate. So if I go back, see 2022, and we do summarize n equals. Oh, I'm just gonna do pitch type. No, pitch name, more descriptive. Okay, so you can see that this person throws that pitch a lot, that pitch a lot, and that pitch a lot. And you can kind of see him here. And then there's some a few points just kind of scattered around. And there's another cluster here for something that's really slow. So probably this one, since I know baseball. Um, it, it, I mean, it makes sense to me that these pitches would have different velocities. It wasn't intuitive to me necessarily that they'd have different spin rates. I mean, I know that now, um, but it wasn't at first intuitive. So anyways, um, interesting to see that. Actually, I, I don't even know now um, if they do. We have to color by pitch up. I, I do know because I've seen these types of graphics for now in years. Okay. So we can see that change up, knuckle curve, slider, fastball. So fastball typically has less spin. It's supposed to be a straight on ball, maybe with some backspin. And um, with a lot of velocity. Okay, so, and we can see, oh cool, we can see some sinkers in here because sinkers are uh, like fastballs. They're typically, yeah, it's a little bit slower. Um, okay, cool. I'm just gonna say, David doesn't like this color scheme. I think it's fine. But there is this, this, this argument, or this, uh, this layer here that allows you to change the color scheme. I guess, I guess it's nicer. And I'm gonna put this all in theme minimal. Okay, I know he likes black and white. He really likes the borders, I don't. Okay. And I think that a lot of people who do data visualization, visualization theory uh, also don't like the borders. So maybe, maybe I should talk to David and tell him to see the light on this. Okay. Great, so that basically creates this plot, which I think is a good one for getting started. Um, okay, so now we'll go and create the top one on uh, StatCast. Okay, so we want cease 20, okay, wait, okay, wait, 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 going too fast. We wanna do this one. So we need to split by, okay. First of all, sinker is basically a fastball. Um, and knuckle curve is basically a, a, a curve. Um, we're not gonna combine all of the pitches together. So it's not gonna be the same graphic where he throws, you can see that there's five pitches here. There's only four here. Basically this combines sinker with fastball. All right, so they're not gonna be exactly the same. That's okay. So we want to first do this thing. Actually, we want to do all of this. Okay, and I want to do, I want release speed again. And then I want y equals pitch name color equals pitch name and then just a hint here, there's different packages that you've seen. Um, GG Ridges 
has these different geomes, these different geometries in it for creating these nice little densities. So geome density ridge, no, ridges. Now I'm gonna just do the theme minimal now. Okay, oops, what did I do? Mm, don't like that. Uh, fill. Yeah, looks pretty good. Okay, so not quite. Not quite the same, um, but pretty good. You can see, yeah, you can see sinker and slider. That sinker is just a little bit slower. He throws a sinker pretty consistently despite not throwing many of them. One thing that's different here is it looks like this plot is actually doing distribution information um, relative to all of the other pitches. So this isn't fastball distribution necessarily. This is this is also so this 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 displays distributional information about the fastball, but also um, it includes the, the the actual density that's depicted here is for like total fastballs among all pitches as well, and that's really apparent with changeup, which is basically just this flat line, whereas this plot is like splitting them up and is doing density for each of the pitches separately. So even though this person didn't throw that many change-ups, it's showing the, the wide, um, or the, 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 the density for change-ups in particular, not relative to the other pitches. So that's a little bit of a notable difference. Um, this density estimate is gonna be very unreliable because as we've seen, the person really only threw 76 change-ups. Well, I shouldn't say it's guaranteed to be this um, unreliable because um, sinkers, he, he threw less sinkers than change-ups, and that was actually pretty pointed. Um, okay, so maybe this person just doesn't have that good of command uh, on a change-up. So work on it, Dylan. Work on your change-up. It's, it's, it's an important pitch. Okay, so, oh my gosh, we are at an hour. This has been too much fun for me. Um, time has just flown by. Okay, so you know what? I'm just gonna copy this directly just to do it. Okay. Okay, David, David's using these, this pipe operator, the one in base R. Um, you know, I've talked with him and he says that that they have uh, improved it even since he taught his class. However, so, okay, well, it doesn't matter. We'll just do it. Okay, so ba, 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 what's going on here? Okay, let's zoom in first of all. Okay, so we have the pitch types. We have locations in the strike zone and we have sort of a a uh, heat heat map type of information on where the pitch was thrown in the strike zone, and of course we can see. Oh, there's also some. What's it called? Transparency added to the point, so like when they are grouped close together, the region is darker. You can see the darker orange versus the lighter orange. It's really apparent when green and blue as well. Okay. All right, so what happened here? So he constructed the strike zone for right-handed hitters. Wait, what? name, batter, name, stand. Hmm. 
Okay. So so okay. So he's filtering by pitchers pitches thrown to right-handed hitters. Okay. So that's fine. That's just that's just because a, a a pitcher may have you know I'm gonna just move. Okay, a pitcher may have a different um, throwing regimen against left-handed batters. Okay, so that's fine. Get rid of the NAs, GG plots. We're doing aesthetics on the 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 X. X, Y location is given by Z in StatCast. The Z axis instead of the Y axis. Okay, so this geome HDR is from this GG density. I think it's from GG. Let's see. Yeah, GG density. So that's in the highest density region. And then he's plotting these different regions here. Okay, and so let's look at them. Let's look at the plot again. Is it already zoomed? Okay, so this light gray, this really, really light gray. So this entire region is essentially where 95% of this pitch uh, sinkers are thrown. The really light gray for here is sliders, then the next lightest gray is 75%, and then here is like the, um, the five percent highest region. So he's essentially against right-handed hitters. He's basically trying to aim his slider down here. Okay, fastball right there. All right. So then, then he adds the strike zone, which is this thing, which is created here, to the visualization, and then he adds points for the pitches. This adds that transparency. We could change this. So now it gets really light. I kind of like that better. Or you could just remove it, which may not be a bad idea. So this would be more like what they did on StatCast, right? We have here, I mean, the regions are range from red to blue, but here they're just ranging from light gray to black, no actual point information, and then a bunch of stuff to change the themes. Um, <clears throat> change the color palette, and then at the end is this facet wrap to um, split the distributional information across the pitches, which is really nice. Okay, so this is a lot. I'm going to, if you're still here, which is great, um, I will say that, so David and I, oops, going too far back, have a active collaboration going on baseball stuff. And I should say that we are not the only ones. Um, there's also Alan Nathan, who is a professor of physics. And he has, oh, what? Hmm. Well, anyways, Alan Nathan is um, a pretty big deal in the space of baseball analytics. And he's a physics professor. He's been doing baseball type work from, of course, from a physics perspective for a very long time. Um, he just gave a very interesting talk on um, looking at bat, like bats that are you know like the same like wood from the same company, and finding variability in the composition of the wood, um, and can show like he can basically pick up a bat and tell you if it's going to be better uh, for a hitter or help you hit the ball further. Uh, so that was a really cool talk. Um, yeah, and then so this is my work. Um, here. So this is a project where I take some baseball statistics, which are uh, cool for like summarizing uh, career value uh, of a player, a statistic called wins above replacement. And then I came up with a um, statistical mathematical model for um, that allows for an error adjustment for that statistic. And there's a whole bunch of material on what I what I did. This is a I shouldn't say me. This is a collaboration with my graduate student Shen Yan and history professor Adrian Burgo. So it's a really interdisciplinary team here. And then also um, uh, statistics professor Chris Kinson. Um, and so like here we have all these. And we don't just have this statistic. We also have a bunch of error adjusted batting statistics for players. So. This is the kind of thing where if you are interested in comparing players across eras or are into these debates or whatever, you can reference our webpage on this and um, 
get air adjusted, like a more air adjusted approach for this. So basically the argument is that back in the old days, a player like Babe Ruth stood miles above their peers um, just due to there not being many high quality peers to populate the MLB. And when that happens, then amazing outlier in talents like Babe Ruth, he is an amazing outlier in talent, can just stand so far above the pack um, in a way that is unrealistic by today's standards. So our model tries to balance how far you stand from your peers when you play against the size of the actual eligible talent pool from the time period that you played in. And we can do that. Uh, paper currently under review. And once it's under, under review, we have our new results. We are gonna update this website. Uh, broad strokes, these top few rankings aren't gonna change too much um, once we do the updating. And we also have a different version of war and you can see this. Okay, so I'm really happy with that project. And then also there's a project that David and I collaborated on for estimating um, batted ball distributions when a particular batter faces a particular pitcher. So here you can see it takes a bit to load up front. So this is when this pitcher faces this batter, what the uh, outcomes on the field are like, likely to be when a ball is hit into play. And if I switch it, switch the pitchers, it changes quite dramatically. Okay, so this is fun as well. Um, Alan Nathan, let's just look at these links as well. This is all stuff going on at University of Illinois. Some of it's my own stuff, but some of it is um, is not me, it's very interesting. Okay, so this is a good article on the work that I did with Shen and Adrian. Um, and this is on my baseball class. You can see here, Charlie Young is mentioned. So Charlie Young is a student that David and I met. He mostly worked with David and Alan Nathan, um, but he did work with me as well on that scene project for batted ball distribution estimation. And he was, um, he's very not happy that this course wasn't offered in my baseball class when he was here, but there's some other students quoted who do, who worked, who were in that class, who now work in baseball as well. So there are a recent um, crop of Illini students who now work as analysts for baseball teams. Um, we also have, as an alumni, the assistant, the current assistant general manager for the Cubs, and me, and his name is Essen Bakari, and me, Essen, and David uh, work together on a an internship where students can get um, experience working in with analytics, advised by David and myself, but Essen as well. And we try to work on projects that are useful for the team. Charlie Young created the Illini Analytics Club. They actually work with the, or have worked in the past with the, um, the, the University of Illinois baseball team. Uh, he's done a lot of good work and he is rising up at the Astros. So that's pretty fun to see. Okay, so a lot is actually going on here. I still maintain that I am in base, baseball for the analytics, not for the game, but it is fun to see all of the, the, the people who uh, this university has uh, produced within this space. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything more to talk about. It's already been a very long video. Thank you for your uh, attention. And I hope that this was very productive for going through and demonstrating the power of dplyr, tidyr, and, um, and ggplot. Um, I mean, this is, this is pretty cool the way it's able to, you know, merge or I take all these data sets and put them all together and display all these different visualizations that are incredibly useful within the space of um, baseball analytics, but you can see how these concepts will generalize well beyond baseball. Okay, I'm still rambling. Um, thank you for watching. Um, if you made it to the end, great job. Take care and I will see you next time. All right, bye.